Which brings us, of course, to the perception that people have of China as this uh, military threat. And as a consequence of that, uh, people, uh, Democrats and Republicans, have just voted for one of the largest, at least in dollar terms, uh, maybe the second largest, something like that, defense spending bill we've ever had, bigger than the Korean wars, bigger than Vietnam, in dollar terms. We'll get to GDP, per cap, GDP percent of GDP in a minute. $768 billion. Uh, Biden just signed a bill. And for those worried the Democrats are going to weaken our defenses and spend less money, the only year in which uh, defense spending was higher than this in terms of dollars was 2011 under Obama. And this bill, $768 billion, is $30 billion more than Donald Trump's last defense budget. $768 billion are being spent by the United States on defense in a year where you would have thought, given that we just left, given that we just left Afghanistan, you would have thought that defense spending would have gone down. And yet, defense spending is going up. The one thing, again, that it seems like Democrats and Republicans agree on is let's spend money. They love spending money. Whether it's on defense or whether it's redistribution, it doesn't matter. Politicians cannot, cannot help themselves. But spend money money. Now, how does this compare to China? Because China is this massive threat, right? How does it compare to China? Well, the United States, as I said, 768 billion. How much does China spend? Well, we don't know exactly. They're not quite as transparent as we are. But estimates are that they spend less than a third than we do. Somewhere probably around 200 billion, maybe 250 billion. But less than a third of what the United States spends is spent by the Chinese government. So it just gives you a sense of this, right? We already have the strongest, biggest, most powerful military of any country in human history. We're spending at a rate nobody in the world comes even close to matching. Our biggest rival, China, spends less than a third of what we spend annually on a defense budget. The United States actually spends 39% of all military spending worldwide, globally. We spend about 39% of that amount. So almost 40% of all the money spent on defense in the entire globe, 40% of that. then, you know, that is just the United States. If you take the 11 countries that spend the most on the military outside of the United States, China, Russia, Saudi Arabia spends a lot of money on, on defense. I have no idea what they're spending it on exactly, but Saudi Arabia. So Russia, Saudi Arabia, UK. The United, Sp United States spends uh, more than the next 11 countries combined. Next 11 countries combined. There is no, there is no threat that if the United States wanted to, it couldn't deal with 
from military perspective. It is this fear-mongering around China, around Russia, is absurd and ridiculous. And of course, neither one of those countries is suicidal enough, crazy enough, to actually attack the United States because of this. Um, Ragnar of the Desert, thank you. Really appreciate that. That's very generous. Thank you for that. Gets us a little closer to the goal. As of uh, 2019, the United States spent about 3.4% of U.S. gross domestic product, GDP, right? Now, that is less as a percentage of GDP than countries like Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Russia. But that's because Saudi Arabia, Israel, and Russia have very, very small GDPs. And you can understand Saudi Arabia and Israel spending a lot of money, particularly Israel, Saudi Arabia, primarily because of the Iranian threat. Russia, it's purely for offensive measures uh, and, and because it views the whole West as a threat to itself. But there's just no threat out there. And it's ever growing. So we would draw troops in Afghanistan. You would think that that would mean that defense spending would go down. And it doesn't. The only time defense spending has really gone down is after the fall of the Berlin Wall. After 1991, with the breakup of the Soviet Union, you saw the Bush administration first, uh, Bush senior, and then the Clinton administration actually cut government spending. And if you look at a chart of government spending per GDP, uh, that has gone down significantly over the years. Uh, it peaked um, in, the, uh, in the early 1980s as Ronald Reagan uh, beefed up uh, spending uh, to combat the Soviet Union. It actually was higher than that during the Vietnam War. It was over 7% of GDP was, uh, uh, was uh, military spending. Then, of course, uh, it peaked again after 9-11, 9-11 was like the bottom in terms of percent of GDP. It was under 3%, it looks like. And then it peaked again in 2011 at over, I don't know, 4 point something percent, 4.5%, 4.6% of GDP. Since then, it's been slowly coming down. And then now, over the last two years, it's heading back up again because we're so worried about China, even though we're spending three times more in terms of dollars than they are. Is this fear, or is this what Eisenhower called the, uh, what did they call it, the uh, military-industrial complex that won't let go of the dollars, that continuously demands more and more? Again, we've talked about this in the past. Why do we have troops all over Europe? Why do we have troops all over Asia? Why do we have troops all over Africa? Why do we have troops all over the Middle East? How much is that costing us? What about all the bureaucracy that keeps all that afloat? All the infrastructure that keeps all that afloat? Imagine if you actually shrunk the US military to what was actually necessary to defend the United States from Russia, China, Iran, whatever. If you actually invested in an efficient deterrent, an efficient, super efficient, would be ideal, super efficient missile defense system, rapid deployment forces, and shrunk everything else. What if we invested in technology instead of in deploying thousands and thousands, well, not thousands, tens of thousands of troops all over the world? But even in a time of inflation, inflation is about 6 7% these days, of growing government deficits and growing government debt, the United States feels rich enough to keep spending, and, and the, both the right and the left keep beating the drum of, we've got an enemy, we've got an enemy, we've got to spend, we've got to spend, we've got to spend. Well, we can't afford to spend, guys. 
This country is already over 100% of GDP in terms of its debt. The debt is only increasing. Defense spending is, I can't tell you, 40% of all discretionary spending, something like that in the United States. Non-discretionary spending, is so security, Medicare, things that Congress can't adjust from year to year, they adjust automatically. If you're going to cut anyway, you're going to have to cut defense. If you're going to cut the budget, you're going to have to cut defense. If you're going to get spending under control, you're going to have to cut defense. Now, you're also going to have to completely change, modify, shrink entitlements, voucherize maybe, privatize maybe. But in the meantime, we're writing bigger and bigger and bigger checks to the military to cope with unknown threats. I found this interesting. You know, China has two aircraft carriers, two aircraft carriers, one that it bought from Ukraine. <laughs> it's an old Russian aircraft carrier. And one I think it produced itself. And it's got, it's building two. So I don't know when they'll be done, but uh, the, you know, the two that it's building will give China four aircraft carriers. China has, you'll see some people who are fear-mongering tell you that China has the largest navy in the world. It does. A lot of little boats, a lot of small boats with very little military offensive capabilities. Two aircraft carriers, two being built right now. The United States, on the other hand, has 11 aircraft carriers. Half the aircraft carriers in the world are in the U.S. In the US Navy. It is also building two new aircraft carriers. These new aircraft carriers are, are, are going to be stunning phenomena. Indeed, they're late in terms of being deployed because uh, they've tried to do too much and, in a sense, put too much technology into these things. But they are going to be, uh, you know, way ahead of anything the Chinese can produce. Uh, American superiority in terms of weapon systems is just unmatched in the world. For many years, during the Soviet Union times, people used to think the Soviet Union had great weapon systems. The, I remember the T-72 tank and, uh, and the MiG, the MiG-27, I think it was, the MiG aircraft, ca uh, aircraft uh, all duds when it came to actual real world. Uh, I mean, if, if you wanted to test your weapon systems, you put them in the Middle East and put them against the Israelis. And the Israelis using American weapon systems and in 1967 using French and British and German weapon systems completely crushed the Arab forces using Soviet weapon systems. I remember being trained um, in a tank corps, and we were very worried about the T-72, the latest, greatest, amazing, stunning Russian tank. And it had, for the first time in history, it had an automatic loader. You know how the, 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 the projectiles that a tank shoots out are loaded in one by one, and uh, most tanks, suddenly in those days, had manual loaders. You would, you would pull out a shell, you would put it into the, whatever it's called, and you would shoot it out, right? And then you would get another one. And it would be tricky. It, it, tanks are very cramped spaces. It's dangerous. You're, these are big explosive things. You, you know, they're heavy, they're difficult, they're complicated. I was in a tank, I shot these things. I know what it's like, not pleasant. Well, the Russians came up with the idea of automatizing it. So they put this automatic system that took out, took out the shell, put it into the cannon, and boom, and wow, we were terrified of this thing. Plus, the T-72 had these very, very, uh, uh, um, this profile it was very uh, uh, slick, so it was very difficult to hit if you were shooting at it with your own tank, your, mis your uh, shells. It turned out, though, this was uh, turned out uh, in the 1982 war in Lebanon, which uh, the Syrians participated in a little bit. They stopped once they realized what was going to happen to them. Um, that 
the nice thing about, for our perspective, uh, the T-72 was you didn't have to hit it. If you managed to explode a shell anywhere close to the T-72, the impact of the shell would cause the automatic loader to completely malfunction and the tank to become useless, useless. That's Russian weapon systems. No thinking about how they actually used in the field. No thinking about the actual consequences. And therefore, you know, I'm not worried about Russians. I'm not worried about Chinese systems. I'm worried about how we're spending our dollars. I'm worried about our capabilities and our capacities and the waste and fraud and corruption that is involved in military spending in the United States. But in terms of the quality of the weapons, once they're built, it takes forever to build them. They're super expensive. But once they're built, once they're in the program, there's no weapon system in the world that can match them. Uh, so uh, really nothing to fear. I more worry about the economic consequences of our government spending like there's no tomorrow, spending on everything, uh, not thinking, this is Republicans and Democrats, not thinking deficits matter, not thinking debt matters. Well, it does matter. And the inflation we're experiencing right now is a consequence of, I think, partially the fact that these deficits and this debt is out of control. And people have realized that we will never be able to pay it back. So, Stop worrying about China. I kept saying this during the Trump years. Stop worrying about China and stop worrying about America. China is not the enemy. The enemy are our universities. The enemy are our politicians. The enemy is our intellectual elites. That's the enemy. The Chinese, we can take care of them easily. Thank you for listening or watching The Iran Brooks Show. If you'd like to support the show, we make it as easy as possible for you to trade with me. You get value from listening. You get value from watching. Show your appreciation. You can do that by going to iranbrookshow.com slash support, by going to Patreon, subscribe star, locals, and just making a appropriate contribution uh, on any one, of those, uh, any one of those channels. Also, if you'd like to see The Iran Brooks Show grow, please consider sharing our content, and of course, subscribe. Press that little bell button right down there on YouTube so that you get an announcement when we go live. And for you, those of you who are already subscribers and those of you who are already supporters of the show, thank you. I very much appreciate it.